talk as loudly as possible so no one demonstrates it. <clears throat> How many of you have ever been to sleep? No one. That's what I thought, right? All right, so we're going to talk about sleep, but also biological rhythms. We want to talk about what is sleep, maybe why do we sleep, uh, what are some physiological mechanisms. We'll talk a little bit about disorders of sleep, but not a whole lot. I'm not going to ask you a lot about disorders of sleep, right? Uh, and then we'll talk about biological clocks. It's going to be exciting. Here's the human brain. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the suprachiasmatic nucleus today. First, we want to think about what is sleep. Uh, the first line is something you might not have considered before, but sleep's actually a behavior, right? You're doing stuff while you're asleep. Your brain is doing a lot while you're asleep. There's a ton of brain activity. It's completely different than the brain activity while you're awake, uh, with one sort of small caveat we'll talk about, but your brain is doing a lot. It's busy, right? Sleep is a behavior. It is something you do, okay? And here's the real surprise. It's motivated by the insistent urge of sleepiness. Anybody experienced that before? About 4 o'clock every Thursday. So, uh, if we want to think about stages of sleep, right, and we want to measure stages of sleep as you're moving through this throughout the night, uh, there are a couple things we might use to measure that. One's going to be an electromyogram, right, we're going to measure some muscle uh, activity, <clears throat> and the electrooculogram will measure eye movements. How many of you have heard of rapid eye movement sleep? Yeah. Uh, why do we call it rapid eye movement sleep? Anybody have an idea? Your eyes are moving rapidly, right? It's, it's right there in the name. Uh, it's, it's not a real surprise, right? So if we, if we measure your eyes and they're moving rapidly, guess what kind of sleep you're in? It's called REM sleep. If your eyes aren't moving rapidly, it's got a really complicated name, non-REM sleep, right? So there you go. This looks extremely comfortable, by the way. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been in for a sleep study, right, Manny? I, you have, you haven't. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, you go in and they like start, you know, taping things to you, right, all over your face. And there's like a bunch of people in lab coats just like staring at you, and all these little devices hooked up to you. And they say, "All right, go ahead and have a regular night's sleep." I don't think it's going to work that well, but there you go. What we're measuring here as well is um, one of the things we didn't talk about is an EEG, right? Electroencephalogram. We're going to measure electrical activity in the brain. How many of you remember that we said your brain runs on electrical signals? That was like an important thing that we've said several times. So your brain runs on electrical signals. We can measure those in a variety of ways. We've talked about jabbing electrodes into your brain cells. Cody, it seems a little invasive, right? Uh, Try to get a good night's sleep while someone's stabbing you in the forehead. Doesn't really, doesn't really work, does it? Uh, but there are other things we can do. We can actually, we actually have these sensitive uh, devices we can put on the outside, right, of your head that can measure electrical activity from your cortex. That little bit that's kind of out on the outside of your brain. When we measure that, uh, we're not getting activity from individual neurons. We're getting activity from a bunch of these neurons collectively, right? So together, we're going to measure this. And they're going to come in some sort of um, repeated activity, right? And so we can measure the frequency of that signal. And as that frequency changes, we know, we'll know we're in different stages of sleep, right? So it's not too bad. So if you're awake, there are sort of two, uh, two types of sleep or two types of uh, EGs you might experience. Uh, alpha activity, right, uh, when you're sort of in that relaxed stage, and then beta activity, that's going to be more irregular, you're going to be awake, you're going to be moving around doing your business, right? If you think about the world for just a moment, uh, it, it comes at you in some sort of random, irregular fashion, right, Sydney? There's, there's not, I mean, you look at it and you're like, oh, okay, well, there are these re repeatable elements perhaps, but it's coming at you in some sort of irregular fashion. So your brain activity, if it's going to reflect that outside world, it needs to also be irregular, right, because it needs to match. Now, once you go to sleep and you can disconnect from that outside world, then your brain activity does not have to mimic that outside world, right? Instead of being irregular, we can start to get more regular patterns. We can get a slower frequency with higher amplitudes. 
because that's going to say more neurons are firing at the same time or not firing at the same time, right? That's how we can get that increased amplitude but decreased frequency, okay? Right now, is the neuron firing? Well, maybe, maybe not, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's responding to the outside world, okay? But when you're asleep, we can get these guys together. They can oscillate back and forth. We can have some really interesting patterns. All right, so you uh, go to sleep. You get into stage one. We start to slow down just a little bit, right? We start to get a little smoother as we move into stage two. Slower still, higher amplitude on these EEG recordings. I'll show you images in just a moment. We have some interesting uh, features in stage two. You'll see these little things called sleep spindles and K-complexes. A K-complex is really your brain activity trying to jump in to that nice, slow, big waveform, okay? Then we move into stage three and stage four. Both of these guys have what's called delta activity, right? This is activity less than four hertz. Remember, a, a hertz is a cycle per second, right? So less than four cycles per second on the up and down on the frequency of your EEG. If you're in stage three, you know, somewhere less than 50% of the time, you're going to be getting this delta activity as you get into stage four. Deeper sleep, deep sleep, you get that stage five, okay? Sometimes we call stage four slow wave sleep. Why would that be? Because we're dealing with that low frequency, that slow waveform, right? And we have that synchronized. When we use the word synchronized, again, what we're referring to here is a number of neurons firing at the same time. And then they're not firing. Their activity is synchronized, right? Can their activity be synchronized while you're awake? Probably not a good idea, right? Because, again, the world is coming at you irregularly. It's not synchronized, the information you're getting. Right, Jocelyn? It's just whatever's out there in the world. It's coming at you. Your neurons better respond to that appropriately, right? But when you're asleep, it doesn't matter, does it? So you can get into that nice oscillation, right? All right. Here's sort of a standard EEG. This is what we would see um, if you're firing at random. It's desynchronized. You've got these small uh, peaks, right? They're not very tall. And they're, they're rapid, right? You're constantly getting these peaks. This is what you would anticipate during uh, some type of awake. Uh, in particular, this is beta activity, but in some type of awake situation, right? Okay. Here's what you would see if you are in a sleep. Notice it's higher peaks, right? So from peak to trough, it's a bigger distance, indicating there are more neurons firing at that particular time, right? And we have fewer peaks, okay, because they're firing and then they're not firing, and then they're firing and then they're not firing. They're doing all of this together, right? So if you think about all of them firing at once, you're going to have a high peak, and then all of them not firing, you're going to have a low trough. If, for example, it's half and half, then you would think about you know, cutting this down a little bit, increasing the number of peaks, but decreasing the size of those peaks, right? So you can kind of think about synchronous versus desynchronous. If your brain patterns are desynchronized, it means you're responding to the world as it's coming to you. If they are synchronized, it means you're disconnected from the world and your brain's on autopilot, right? Just going back and forth, back and forth, okay? Neurons firing, not firing, they're just coming back and forth. They can do that because, again, you're not responding to the world. You're not planning movements. You're not thinking about what you're going to eat for dinner, right? You're asleep, okay? Your brain's doing its business. <clears throat> I think this is probably graphically summarizes everything I just said to you, right? And so if all of those words didn't really make a lot of sense, hopefully this helps a little bit, right? Here's your awake, nice low amplitude, high frequency, and as you move deeper and deeper into sleep, stage three, stage four here, notice the amplitude increases, the frequency decreases, right? You're getting that nice oscillation of activity. Okay? The exception to this is REM sleep, right? The interesting thing about REM sleep is REM sleep really mimics um, Well, that was something. <clears throat> Is that somebody who belonged here? No, but you guess not. 
All right, maybe we should. Sh All right, so I don't know. That's not the fastest I've scared away someone, but uh, it's up there in the top ten. So uh, sta uh, stages of sleep. We were talking about REM sleep. Notice uh, REM sleep activity is pretty similar to what you might see uh, when you're in that sort of beta activity, right? Higher frequency, lower amplitude. Okay. In this case, we are getting irregular activity in REM sleep, right? What we're going to learn later is that slow wave sleep and REM sleep do two different things for you, right? Different kinds of memory, different kind of things going on here. The point of this whole story is you should probably sleep more than you do, um, is, is my guess for most of you. Um, so remember last week when I told you that you were all going to lose your hearing uh, before I do, and I was excited about that? You're all also probably going to lose your memories before I do. Uh, because I know, right? You guys are really looking forward into getting Alzheimer's. Um, one of the best ways to prevent developing Alzheimer's disease is to actually sleep. Uh, while you're asleep, your brain is doing some cleanup, right? So throughout the day, as your uh, brain cells are busy cooking, doing their business, they create a lot of cellular debris, right? Like physical debris that can cause damage uh, to your cells. It can get things clogged up. If that doesn't get cleaned out, that accumulates and builds up over time, right? And as that builds up over time, what that'll do is that'll start to uh, cause your cells to die, right? And as your brain cells die, they, they don't really come back, right? And so if you start losing them at a pretty rapid rate, you start to really lose some uh, neurological functions. So you'll learn about more of that later. It's a great uplifting lecture. Here's a mythical person who sleeps eight hours a night. <clears throat> I think most of you sleep in this range, or some of you sleep like 12, right? That's what I found with, is that true? Yeah, right, you either sleep far less than you should or far more than you should, right? Uh, and I say should based on this average of like eight hours. Uh, everybody's kind of got their own sleep rhythm. I think that's an important thing to, to think about, right? Uh, you want to make sure that you <clears throat> are getting the appropriate amount of sleep for you, right? There are folks who actually require less sleep than others, uh, and there are folks who need more sleep than others, right? And so you need to plan your life accordingly, depending on which group you fall in, right? Don't try to force it one way or the other, or you'll go the way of our great friend Descartes. And uh, remember, he died. He died from getting up early, right? He was not a guy who should have been getting up early, but he did. That's what you get for choosing philosophy as a major. Uh, you just get whatever jobs they offer. You don't really get a pick. Anybody a philosophy? Ma you can't be a philosophy major here, can you? We even have that as a major. Kyle, you don't know. I know it's a. I understand it's upstairs, and they teach philosophy classes, but I don't think they have philosophy major. I think you can only do it as a minor now. Is that true? They do have philosophy majors. They do. That's just because they haven't graduated yet. I don't know if that's accurate. Uh, and I guess if you are a philosophy major, that's okay. I'm trying to think. I mean, you can get jobs as a philosophy major, right? Oh, philosophy. What do you do with the philosophy degree? I, probably one of the most important things ever. You just sit and think. What would you say? <laughs> that's a little unfair. Uh, I think you just sit around and think about stuff. Now, there are people who will pay you a ton of money to sit around and think, but you've got to be one of the best to sit around and think, right? And I don't know that you guys are in that category. I mean, I mean, don't take it the wrong way, but I, I, I just don't, I don't see it happening. And I think you, you might want to have another skill set to fall back on, right? <laughs> it's just my guess. I mean, like think tanks, right? Think tanks, right? They'll they'll pay you like a lot of money just to like think of stuff, but you have to. The problem with that is you got to find like. I shouldn't use that phrase. There's a phrase I wanted to use here, but I'm not going to because it's probably not a nice one. You have to find some like rich old guy who thinks the same way you do, or that you're willing to think like he does, and come up with ideas that align with that, right? And they'll they'll like throw a bunch of money at you and give you a job. I know you're thinking about this, right? I was going to use the phrase sugar daddy, but I wasn't. I was, I was like, that's yeah, that's exactly what it is. Uh, so 
as you go through sleep, you know, you sleep through the night, right? You actually go through these different stages, okay? And so you start out, obviously, stage one, two, three, four, and then you kind of bounce around. What you'll notice is as you go through the night, you don't get into your deep sleep as much, but you spend more time in uh, REM sleep, which is kind of exciting, right? If you, and this is a fun thing to try, if you try to stay up, Ebony, two or three days in a row, right? Okay, it's fun. Uh, what you'll find is that like the following day when you actually go to sleep, you'll sleep longer than you normally do. If you're normally an eight-hour person, you'll sleep 12 hours. The next night you might sleep 10 and you get down to nine and eight, back to your normal, right? Uh, you'll try to pay back that sleep debt, right? You'll try to keep, um, you know, get back up to where you should be, right? What's also really interesting, and this tells you that slow wave sleep uh, or deep sleep and uh, REM sleep are, are two different things. They have two different mechanisms. <laughs> If you deprive yourself of REM sleep, which this is fun, you can do it with your roommates, right? If you have one, uh, this is exciting. So you you tape these uh, you know electrodes to their eyes, and every time you find their eyes moving rapidly, uh, you go over and just wake them up, right? Because you don't want them getting into REM sleep. What you'll find is that if you let them sleep the next night, they'll actually spend more time in REM sleep than they normally would because they're trying to pay back the REM sleep debt, which is separate from the whole sleep debt, right? So they're two different kind of mechanisms monitoring uh, REM and non-REM sleep, and they're doing two different things for you. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, here are some other things you can look for to tell if you're in REM sleep or if you're in slow wave sleep. Some of those are uh, more personal than others, right? Uh, did you read the book, uh, Kaylee, about the uh, stamps? Roll of stamps, no. You want me to tell them about the roll of stamps? Stamps used to come in a roll. That's a shocker. Anybody use stamps anymore? Nobody uses. Yeah, you're like. Send <laughs> you send letters. Well, there you go. Uh, so stamps used to come in a roll and they were perforated, right? And so one thing you might decide to do at some point in your life is figure out if you have erectile dysfunction, and I, or if someone you know does, right? So it's like randomly walk up to someone and say, "Hey, you got a roll of stamps." Uh, but there are like two reasons why you might have um, erectile dysfunction. There are physical reasons and there are psychological reasons. If uh, you want to determine which it is, so then you know which doctor to go to, right? It will save you a trip. You can get a roll of stamps, um, apply those roll of stamps exactly where you think you should, and then wake up uh, the next day and see if the perforations are broken. And if they are, then it's not a physical issue. Um, it's a psychological issue. And so you can figure out which doctor to go to, right? Save you a step. Just write that down. That's a good, uh, good life lesson. Questions about that or probably anything else? Probably not that. Nope. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, don't worry too much about this. Uh, why do we sleep, right? That's important. Uh, sleep is not a state of unconsciousness, right? Not a state of unconsciousness. Some of you have reached states of unconsciousness, right? That's not the same as sleeping. Those are two different things. Uh, that's one of those signs of adulthood, Cody, right? When you realize, like, hmm, blacking out and sleeping are two different things. Uh, and so when you recognize that, you're like, great. The other thing is expiration dates. When you start to pay attention to those, uh, you're well on your way to, uh, to adulthood. So there you go. Two things to look for. You have a ton of mental activity during REM sleep and during slow wave sleep. Okay? All vertebrates sleep. What's a vertebrate? It's a thing with a backbone, right? So all animals with backbone sleep. Interestingly, only warm-blooded vertebrates seem to have REM sleep, right? Okay, so we're thinking about birds and mammals there. Anybody got a lizard at home? No, nobody's going to. You got a snake? Yeah, it probably doesn't go into REM sleep, okay? It does sleep, right? But it doesn't go into REM sleep because it's a lizard it doesn't, or a reptile. It doesn't need that, right? For whatever reason. Uh, what about humans? Humans is definitely needed. It's not. Um, it's not necessarily related to your, like your normal body function, right? Like, like sleep is different. It's definitely got some cognitive uh, uh, function, some cognitive benefit to sleeping, right? We already talked about rebound sleep. For those of you, I mean, this is going to be important. That's why I like to give this lecture the week before the exam. Some of you next Wednesday will decide to stay up all night and try to study. I'll tell you that's a waste of your time. Not only is it a waste of your time, uh, whatever little bit you do know, right, 
uh, you're, you're going to lose that by staying up. Okay, sleeping actually improves your memory. So what you should do after this class, what I'd like to do is like have a bunch of cots, right? You stay in class for two hours, and then you take a 30-minute nap before you go home. That would improve your uh, memory. Nobody, Kyle, we should run this experiment. We should get the university to give everybody 30 minutes of nap time after each class and see if their test grades improve. You don't think they'll show up for what? The nap time? Or either? Probably. Hey, who loves dolphins? Uh, I know that's a random question, right? Dolphins sleep. That shouldn't be surprising, right? Because, uh, Tyler, we just said all vertebrates sleep, right? The cool thing about dolphins, though, uh, so let's think about you. And what do you have when you sleep that a dolphin doesn't have when it sleeps? Uh, and that's a bed, right? Most humans sleep in a bed or some thing they call a bed, right? Whatever that is, you might uh, have a futon or a water bed or a hammock, right? It's all kind of the same. Uh, dolphins don't have those, okay? And the other thing is dolphins are like always being pursued by something that could eat them, right? And you're probably not. So you can kind of stop and sleep dolphins. The cool thing about dolphins is they only sleep one hemisphere at a time. So they'll shut off their right hemisphere and put it to sleep, leave their left hemisphere going, uh, and so they can still like swim around. It's pretty exciting, right? So how do we know that? Well, <laughs> there was a guy who, who was like, hey, I want to know how dolphins sleep. Because they would notice that dolphins were always like moving, right? They're not like rolling over, taking a nap somewhere. Okay. So here you go. Here's the dolphin when it's awake, left and right hemisphere. Uh, as it goes through sleep stages, you see that one hemisphere goes to sleep, the other stays awake, and then they flip. So there you go. It's pretty exciting, right? Ducks do something similar. Uh, ducks take this a step, step extra, to be honest, right? So when ducks sleep, they'll actually um, they'll kind of huddle up. Right? That's how ducks sleep. And then there'll be ducks who swim around those sleeping ducks, right? So you're either like a like a full sleep duck or a half sleep duck, right? And the ducks that are swimming around in a circle watching the other ducks, they'll put their uh, be their outer hemisphere, but their inner eye, right? They'll put that hemisphere to sleep, and it's like then they'll leave the other eye open, uh, at, facing outward, and then they'll rotate, right? Like one of those ducks in the middle will swim out and replace, and they'll come in and I'll kind of swap out like that. It's pretty exciting, right? You guys should try this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, essentially, yeah, that's it right there. Uh, they take turns sleeping and they go around and tap somebody on the shoulder and they got to run out and go to <laughs> wake one hemisphere. It's kind of a crazy thing and it's weird. It's only, uh, you know, it's only a handful of species probably that, that sleep like this. Uh, I wouldn't anticipate a lot of species doing this, but I. I think, like, what if we could figure out how to do this as humans? Like, think about, you know, all of the extra things you could do if you could sleep one hemisphere at a time, right? I mean, it would be difficult, like, if you were trying to run because you just run in a circle uh, because, like, you know, one leg would literally be asleep and you just, you just kind of spin around. Uh, but you could possibly do other things, right? Think about, like, how quickly you could get through a season of Stranger Things. You wouldn't have to take a break, right, to sleep and just stay awake and switch eyes. See, I'm still trying to save you time here. Yeah, I wouldn't tell anybody you learned how to do this. People. <laughs> All right. Good luck with that. Uh, we do need to sleep. Again, it reduces free radicals. Uh, these are you know, molecules that can cause damage. I don't want to get too much into that. There is something called fatal familial insomnia. How many of you have ever thought you've had insomnia? You probably didn't, so just don't worry about it. Uh, everybody has had difficulty sleeping from some, you know, at some point in their life. That's perfectly normal. Insomnia is, there's a little bit of an extra threshold you got to hit for that. This fatal familial insomnia is a genetic disorder that folks inherit. Uh, once you're diagnosed with this, you got about six months until you die. That's really a 
really nice. There's, there doesn't seem to be any cure to it. Uh, folks who have this, they say that they're um, like always walking around in like a dreamlike state. They have difficulty regulating their autonomic nervous system. Got some other weird things going on. Uh, REM sleep, we already talked about brain development, learning. Uh, we talked about REM rebound. There's that fatal familial insomnia, right? Uh, people are always confused. Uh, increased body temperature, things like that happen. Not a big deal. Rim rebound, we talked about that. So, we have not yet talked about learning and memory, but let's imagine that you understand that learning and memory exist, and there are different kinds of memory, right? Okay. There's what we call non-declarative and declarative memory. Right now, I'm not expecting you to know a lot about that, but I do want you to think about rim sleep and slow wave sleep promoting the consolidation of different kinds of memories. Okay. So here's a great study. Uh, this is when they gave folks a 90 minute nap. right? Uh, some folks didn't get a nap, some folks only got slow wave sleep, and then some folks were able to get into slow wave sleep and REM sleep, and they had some non-declarative uh, visual discrimination task. You can see the folks that slept and got into REM and slow wave sleep actually performed better. Your slow wave sleep, sleep <clears throat> and learning. Again, non declarative doesn't really seem to work, uh, make much of a difference, but that declarative uh, makes a big difference. Okay? All right, let's talk about uh, some uh, physiological mechanisms of sleep and waking, right? During the day, your body produces a sleep promoting substance. And I know that sounds really kind of vague. I'm going to go ahead and give you the name for that. It's adenosine. Okay. Basically, every sort of metabolic uh, process in your brain cells uh, results in some leftover adenosine, right? Okay. It's kind of like scrap. Okay. How many of you have ever built a birdhouse? You had like leftover pieces, and you're like, I don't know what this is for, uh, right? Because you, you cut the wood to fit, and you've got these little pieces left over. That's what adenosine is. As you stay awake, you create more and more and more adenosine, right? Over time, as your brain cells are active. Okay? So, you need to go to sleep so you can clean up this adenosine and start over. All right. We do have a flip flop circuit that we do want to think about briefly. Don't worry about some of the rest of this. The basic idea of a flip flop is it's either on or it's off, right? can't be both. Okay? You cannot simultaneously turn on and off your lights. Right? It's either on or it's off. Okay? You're either asleep or you're awake. Right? And the brain mechanisms, the brain regions that control this, uh, they're either activated or they're inhibited. Right? And you've got one for sleep and one for being awake. And we'll kind of build that circuit here in a few moments. All right. And there is adenosine, that neuromodulator that initiates sleep. How many of you have ever ingested caffeine in order not to uh, go to sleep? That's something people have, ha have done to combat sleepiness, right? I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. No, nobody's heard of that. As, as I'm looking around seeing people drinking coffee and energy drinks and, you know, other items. Uh, how does this work, right? Well, one of the cool things that caffeine does is it actually blocks your adenosine receptors. Okay. So your neurons have adenosine receptors, and when you have a bunch of adenosine, you go, hey. Hey, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Is that the same as adenosine, which they use to treat high heart rates? I know that sounds crazy, but it's the same spelling. It's a chemical in your brain. Sure, sure. I'm not really familiar with that particular use, but uh, okay. adenosine puts you to sleep. Your heart rate's usually lower when you're asleep. It makes sense to me. Kyle, you okay over there? Yes. Okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I would assume it would be the same. That was a good question. Uh, so adenosine receptors in your brain, they're blocked by caffeine, right? And so if you're blocking those receptors, no matter how much adenosine you're creating, uh, you're not going to necessarily, necessarily feel sleepy. However, there is sort of a limit on this, right? Eventually the caffeine is going to wash out. It's going to degrade. It's going to be metabolized. 
you're still going to have that giant pile of adenosine that's there ready to fill those receptors once that caffeine wears off, right? Here's some other neurotransmitters. We've talked about a few of these, probably those three. We probably have not talked about orexin or histamine. We will talk about those a little bit today. How many of you have ever taken an antihistamine and fallen asleep? It's a pretty standard thing, right? Benadryl? Uh, that's because histamine keeps you awake. We'll talk about orexin as well. Acetylcholine is important for uh, cortical arousal, right? And you can see that uh, in cortex, when you're awake, you've got high levels of acetylcholine. They drop during slow wave sleep, and then they jump back up during REM sleep. We said REM sleep was similar to being awake. Same brain activity, so you'd expect the same uh, sort of levels of uh, acetylcholine. Similar story in the hippocampus. Why do we mention the hippocampus? We haven't talked about this much, but that's a guy doing memory consolidation. Okay. Don't worry about this rap brain business. Uh, norepinephrine. Uh, norepinephrine is again um, also known as noradrenaline. <clears throat> right? How many of you have ever had an adrenaline rush while you're asleep? Doesn't really work that way. Doesn't work that way, right? That's why you make the confused face. Yeah, it doesn't work that way, right? So if you've got a bunch of adrenaline or noradrenaline going around in your body, you're probably not going to sleep. This is what increases uh, vigilance, right? You can see here while you're awake, you've got higher levels of adrenaline or norepinephrine, noradrenaline, than you do while you're in either set, uh, either kind of sleep. Uh, what about serotonin? <clears throat> right, serotonin is another guy that's going to typically increase while you're sleeping. Um, anybody familiar with SSRIs? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? Uh, they'll prescribe this for a number of uh, issues. Uh, one of the main side effects of an SSRI is sleepiness, right? I don't know if you or anybody you've known has taken an SSRI. It's one of the number one uh, sort of side effects that they'll experience is some increase. And not a big deal there. Histamine, we already talked about histamine. Uh, again, it controls wakefulness. I don't want to think too much about that. Orexin, on the other hand, this is a guy that um, is, you don't really think about this too much, right? It does have an excitatory effect. This is going to be important here in a few moments when we start talking about that flip-flop circuit. We talk about the input of these orexinergic neurons onto that flip-flop circuit, okay? All right, there's just a nice chart. Don't worry about that. All right, so what we want to do now is we want to start building this uh, flip-flop circuit for uh, sleep and wake, right? So the first thing is we want to have what's called the VLPOA, right? It's the ventral lateral preoptic area, okay? This, right, this guy, uh, and some brainstem regions participate in what's called mutual inhibition, right? This basically means if one of these is turned on, the other one's turned off, okay? When the other one gets turned on, it turns off the other guy, right? One is on, one is off all the time. They both can't be on at the same time. They both can't be off at the same time, right? On or off, okay? When the brainstem arousal system is activated, you're going to be alert in your, in your awake state. When you are activating your sleep region there in the ventral lateral preoptic area, then you're going to be in your uh, slow wave sleep. Okay. Let's add a layer to this. Let's add those orexinergic neurons out there in the hypothalamus. These guys are going to activate. They're going to have an excitatory input onto that brainstem region, right? So when the orexinergic neurons are active, right, you've got some motivation to stay awake. They're going to activate the brainstem. The brainstem is going to be on. Because it's on, it's going to be turning off the VLPOA, right, so you don't go to sleep. And you're going to stay awake. That's going to be awesome. If you lose this motivation to remain awake, then you'll fall asleep, right? It's that simple. Don't 
Don't worry about these. That's just the adenosine levels as you sleep. You know how that works. Acetylcholine, we'll skip over this. Oh, we should go back briefly and talk about REM paralysis, right? Uh, thankfully, while you're in REM sleep and you're getting that normal brain activity, uh, your body is paralyzed. Now, there are individuals who have a REM sleep, uh, REM paralysis disorder, right? They'll actually get up and act out their dreams, okay? And while you think that might be exciting, right, uh, it could really be uh, dangerous, right? Let's imagine you, uh, I don't know how many of you have had this dream. How many of you have imagined you're Usain Bolt, right? And you're going to run like the 100 the meter dash, okay? And you're going to win, right? That's great as long as your bedroom is at least 100 meters long. Right? If your bedroom is less than 100 meters, guess what happens? You hit a wall, you hit a window, you hit a dresser, right? Okay. So you're disconnected from reality. Whatever you're dreaming is what you're experiencing. You're going to interact with that, uh, right? It can be kind of frightening. There have actually been folks who have killed people while they were asleep. Don't try this. Uh, and if they can successfully prove that they have some kind of uh, like REM sleep disorder, they can often be acquitted of those crimes. I say often, it's you know, happened at probably a handful of times, but, uh, but it has been a successful defense before. Okay. This is different than sleepwalking. Somebody's going to ask me that, right? Who's going to do it? Nobody? Yeah, it's a little different than sleepwalking. Different mechanisms are involved. Sleepwalking, for the most part, is something that you outgrow. It's really common in like uh, young boys, like six to eight, maybe 10 years old. Beyond that, sleepwalking doesn't really happen, but you can't have a REM sleep uh, disorder, right? So if you are an 8 to 10-year-old boy and you're like getting up walking around while you're asleep, don't freak out too much, right? If you're still doing it when you're 15, uh, then, you know, you might want to get something checked out. <clears throat> also, people who eat while they're asleep. That's a crazy one too, right? Uh, sleep eating disorders. And I'm not talking about like, you know, like your dad who wakes up in the middle of the night and tries to eat frosted flakes, right? Um, Anybody have a dad who eats frosted flakes in the middle of it, right? <clears throat> it happens, right? This is different, right? So, so folks will wake up. They're not, they won't wake up, actually. They'll, they'll get up. They'll go into their kitchen. They'll often eat something, and then they will go back to sleep, and they'll have no recollection that they've eaten that. That can cause a problem for a couple reasons. Sometimes you eat things while you're asleep that should be cooked, right? And uh, like raw meats, for example. And eating raw meats, Melina, can give you, like, bad things, right? can happen. Uh, and so you should, should avoid that. The second thing is it can be really uh, disconcerting the next day when your turkey sandwich is gone and you don't know who took it, right? And then you start making up, right, Just you make up a story about somebody breaking into your home and stealing your turkey sandwich. Uh, and, in fact, it was just you that ate your own turkey sandwich. So watch out. for <clears throat> she's not there yeah now if it happens occasionally it's not a problem right but if it's a if it's a continued behavior you should probably get that checked out yeah there you go. You all right? Okay. Oh, there you go. All right. Uh, rim sleep. We're not going to worry too much more about that. There is a flip flop for the rim sleep. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about this, right? It's a little separate from that. But what I do want you to focus on here is, <clears throat> again, still those orexinergic neurons. What are the things that are keeping those orexinergic neurons uh, amped up, right? One of those is hunger. How many of you have gone to bed hungry? It's not easy to do, right? How many of you, it's like the number one thing somebody tells you whether right or wrong, they'll tell you if you want to lose weight, don't eat before you go to bed. The problem is it's hard to go to bed when you're hungry, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so what do you do? Uh, it, it's a battle, right? And that's probably one of the hardest things. Um, and the reason you can't go to sleep is because if you go to sleep and you're too hungry, you don't wake up. You just die, right? And so your body doesn't want you to go to sleep because you should have some nutrients to get you through the night and get you up so you can acquire food the next day, right? 
So you got to kind of keep an eye on that. Now, most of us who have refrigerators and microwaves these days, that's not a real threat, right? Uh, and I'm not trying to make light of folks who are food insecure. That's a whole separate and very serious issue. But sort of in a modern Western society, uh, like dying of hunger in your sleep is not probably at the top of our list of concerns, right? Your body biologically is still looking out for that. Probably not going to happen to you. Uh, satiety signals, though, work the other way, right? How many of you sleep really well after a giant, I don't know, cheeseburger, right? There you go. Also, we'll talk briefly later about biological clock times, right? All right. <clears throat> you can plug in that REM sleep flip-flop into the main flip-flop signal. I don't want you to worry about that. But again, we have those direct synergic neurons right in there. All right, don't worry about narcolepsy, REM sleep, sleep apnea. I'm not going to ask you about these things. We talked about REM sleep behavior, sleep-related eating disorders. All right, I think we can talk about biological clocks now, right? Anybody have one of these? It's when you take those two potatoes. You guys ever make one of those clocks with the two potatoes and you cram the electrodes in there? You guys don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Potato clocks. You got one at home? Swap the potatoes. I think uh, oranges will work as well. Anything that's like uh, like a little bit acidic. You guys still don't know what I'm talking about, do you? You guys missed out. See, when I was a kid, we had the thing called Mr. Wizard. And he would get other kids together and they would do stuff, right? Anybody familiar with Mr. Wizard? Yeah, so I got super excited once. Was I... Uh, when I was in middle school, a little old probably to be watching Mr. Wizard, right? <laughs> but uh, all the same, Mr. Wizard was coming to my middle school. And I was super excited. The only thing that has ever gotten me out of bed early was Mr. Wizard. And I would get up early every day, like when I was in kindergarten and first grade, to watch Mr. Wizard before I went to school. Uh, then I went back to sleep during Woody Woodpecker and got back up and ate my uh, oatmeal and went to school because I was like, ah, I'm taking a nap. Uh, now I've put up too much effort. Had to clear out that adenosine uh, watching Mr. Wizard. Super excited. I was super disappointed. It was not Mr. Wizard. It was someone filling in for Mr. Wizard. Uh, apparently he got sick and couldn't travel. So I got somebody else instead. All I remember is she mixed up a bunch of cornflakes in a blender and then used a magnet to pull out the iron. And then the rest of the day was all disappointment. So biological clocks. <clears throat> How many of you have heard of circadian rhythms? Right? Yeah, pretty straightforward, right? Basically, uh, you do different things at different times of the day, right? And I don't mean like, oh, I've got a schedule and I go to this class then and this class now. I'm talking about like sleep-wake cycles, other things, right? We have uh, a stimulus that resets that biological clock. Anybody have an idea what sort of the biggest uh, stimulus is that we might have that would reset our biological clocks? It's huge. Yeah, the sun, right? Yeah, it's probably like the, the biggest thing in our solar system by whatever order of magnitude you want to put on it, right? It's like 99.9% .9 of the mass in our solar system. Uh, so, light comes in. Anybody ever tried to work the uh, like the night shift? Yeah, right? It's kind of tricky sometimes, right? Because like, it's dark and you're like, man, I should be asleep. And then you're trying to sleep during the day and you got to get those like darkening curtains or an eye mask or something, right? It's really tricky. Okay, uh, your hypothalamus is really involved in this, in particular the suprachiasmatic nucleus. All this means is it's above the optic chiasm, right? And it's actually getting input from your eyes. There are uh, ganglion cells in your eyes that are photosensitive. I know we said only rods and cones, right? So I lied to you that day. There are these ganglion cells that are photosensitive. They project directly to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? And they say, hey, it's daylight, you should be awake. And melanopsin is the uh, photopigment in those uh, retinal ganglion cells. A number of years ago, folks did an experiment with rats. Rats are typically active in the dark, right? You turn off the lights, they get up and they do stuff. You turn on the lights, they go to sleep. If you just kind of give them, um, you know, ambient light, you know, like during the day, they'll actually shift, right? Because they don't have any their activity pattern throughout the days. They don't have anything to reset that, right? And your activity pattern is pretty similar. You're on more of like probably a 25-hour cycle than you are a 24-hour cycle. 
And so if we were to put you in a room for a number of days, uh, didn't let you know what time it was, didn't have the lights on too, light, too high or too low, what you would find is that over time, you would sort of shift your activity patterns just a little bit each day, right? There'd be kind of a little bit of a drift. Uh, you do have to have that reset point to bring you back to the starting point. There was actually an interesting study uh, a few years ago. Uh, they were interested to know, because this, is, this always comes up all the time, right? Like, oh, people sleep less now because we have electric lights. Back when you had to have like candles or fires, people would sleep more, right? That was kind of the idea. So some researchers got together, they bought a bunch of Fitbits, and they said, hey, let's slap a bunch of Fitbits on some folks who live in traditional hunter-gatherer societies currently, and let's see what their sleep-wake patterns are, right? And what they found is that they're actually pretty similar to what ours are uh, in, in societies where we have electric lights, so there wasn't a big difference there. The other interesting thing that they found is it wasn't just the sun that was the sort of the reset point. They actually found it was really related to temperature. So what they found is that they, uh, these folks would, in the winter, they would actually stay in, they would sleep a little later in the day until the sun got up and the temperature was a little warmer. And then in the summer, they would stay up later after the sun had gone down because it was still warm until it had cooled down. So there you go. So if you want to have a good night's sleep, you should try to be as cold as possible, right? So I keep my thermostat on like 66 at my house. So I can sleep all the time. Don't worry about the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We already talked about that. Talked about that uh, retinohypothalamic pathway. Circadian rhythms. End result. Suprachiasmatic nucleus is part of the hypothalamus. Uh, the lateral hypothalamus is surprisingly also part of the hypothalamus. So we're getting information coming in from the eye. It eventually gets to those erexinergic neurons, turns on your arousal system. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. There are some folks who have advanced or delayed uh, sleep phase syndrome. These are folks who have difficulty uh, sort of uh, uh, some of them have difficulty getting up before, let's say, 10 a.m., but they can't go to bed before 3 a.m., right? And then there are folks who are the reverse, right? They can't really stay up past 8 or 9 o'clock, and then they wake up every day at, like, 5 a.m. I'm not talking about people who've, like, practiced this over time. I'm talking about these are just kind of their natural rhythms, right? Obviously, our buddy uh, Renee was in this category, right? It's Renee D. Uh, he was in that category, had the, the delayed uh, sleep phase syndrome, didn't like to get up early, really screwed him up uh, when he started getting up early. And don't worry about that. Or that. All right. Who's got questions about sleep? I didn't look up, so I didn't see any hands move. I assume you're all.